Welcome. Today is Wednesday, December 13th, 2017, and this is the NERI Early Career Researcher Forum. This forum is intended to foster the exchange of ideas and be a platform for best practices for successful research. It is intended to highlight compelling research, build up the natural hazards engineering student community, and provide presentation opportunities. For more information, visit the NERI website at designsafe ci .org, um, where you can find links to the Sim Center and the NERI Learning Center. Today's webinar is coordinated by the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructures Simulation and Computational Modeling Center. This webinar is supported by the National Science Foundation under awards 1612843 and 1520817. Any statements in the webinar are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent the views of the National Science Foundation. Today's presentation is by Majid Abad Sachani. He is a PhD candidate in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Rice University. Since starting his PhD uh, at Rice, he has been studying the seismic risk to concrete dry cask structures used for storage of spent nuclear fuel. His advisor is Jamie Pageant, and the title of his presentation is High Performance Computed, Computing Aided Seismic Risk Assessment of Vertical Concrete Dry Casks. Majid, I invite you to begin your presentation. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Uh, first, I want to say hello to all our participants and thank you for your interest and time. And I also want to thank SIEM uh, Center for this opportunity. Uh, today, I will talk about my research project, uh, which is about seismic risk assessment of vertical dry casks, which, as, as you said, are used for the storage of a spent nuclear fuel. At first, I will talk about the motivation uh, behind this study. Then I will walk you through seismic analyses and tip over analyses. And then I'll briefly mention the role of HPC in research projects like mine. And then I will finish with conclusions and future work. So currently about 20% uh, of the electricity in the United States comes from nuclear power plants. And safe storage of spent nuclear fuel is a very important issue in this industry. The storage process usually has uh, three major steps, short-term storage, interim storage, and long-term storage. For short-term storage, uh, special pools are used, which are called the spent fuel pool. In these pools, uh, the spent fuel is kept below water, and water circulation cools down the fuel, and it also acts uh, like shielding for the radiation. The spent fuel has to remain in these pools for at least five years before it's uh, transported to interim storage facilities. For the interim storage, independent spent fuel storage installations or ISFSIs are used. The structure which is used for the storage is called dry casks. Uh, there, are call, there are two major designs of the casks. One is horizontal rectangular models and the other one is vertical casks. In these uh, structures, uh, flow of air cools down the fuel, and uh, that's why the structure is called dry cask. My research uh, is about vertical concrete dry casks. The structure looks like uh, what you see in the picture. It's a vertical cylinder made of reinforced concrete. It has a mold, uh, which is called liner, and it, uh, it is used basically during the construction uh, construction phase and uh, remains with the structure. The cask receives the fuel in a steel canister. The steel canister is loaded at the location of the pools, which I talked about before, and then it's sealed and transported to the location of the cask. And then the canister is inserted into the cask and it remains there. The vertical casks have air vents uh, on the bottom and on top, 
and airflow through the bottom of the cask and then exiting from top of the cask cools down the structure, cools down the span fuel. Currently, there is no long-term solution for the uh, storage of span fuel in the United States. And because of that, these structures have to be in service for long periods of time. So aging is a threat to these structures. In addition, uh, since the structure is not mechanically attached to its foundation, uh, under lateral loads, it might display different modes of motion. Specifically, it might rock, uh, which causes uh, angles of rotation, or it might slide or wobble. By wobbling, I mean a motion in which uh, the cask uh, tilts slightly and then uh, it spins around its longitudinal axis. It causes a horizontal displacement for the structure. So the rocking causes uh, angles of rotation and sliding and wobbling cause horizontal displacements. In 2011, an earthquake happened in Virginia. The magnitude of the earthquake was 5.8 and it hit a nuclear power plant. Uh, although the structure, uh, although the earthquake was not very uh, high, was not, did not have a very uh, large magnitude, um, some of the casks uh, on the nuclear power plant moved and uh, the motion of some of them reached uh, about five inches or 10 centimeters. And it raised many questions about the safety of this storage option. So the final goal of my project is to estimate the seismic risk to the vertical dry casks. And to do that, uh, I need to answer questions like the probability of seismically induced large motions. I also want to know uh, what happens if two adjacent casks hit each other because of large motions, or what happens if a cask falls down and hits uh, its foundation? In this presentation, I will talk about the seismic analyses and the tip over analyses. Moving to the seismic analyses, uh, this is my workflow. It has five major steps, experimental design, finite element modeling, and then meta model development, uh, fragility analysis, and at the end, risk estimation. Let's just start with experimental design. By experimental design, I mean a process in which we design virtual experiments to uh, study the problem at hand. Here we are interested in the seismic response of the dry casks and we want to consider uh, the most important parameters. To do that, we have considered 12 parameters, uh, mainly geometric and material parameters, as well as the weight of the cask and also the friction coefficient between the cask and its foundation. By using Latin hypercube sampling, uh, I generated 160 configurations of this problem. Uh, I also performed an earthquake selection uh, for the West Coast, Central, and East Coast. And uh, we analyzed uh, the configurations that I talked about subjected to the ground motion suite. For the analysis, uh, I used the LS Sina. Uh, this figure shows one of my models in which I modeled the pad and the cask and its uh, contents with solid elements and the soil with discrete elements. The model is nonlinear in the sense that there's a contact between the cask and its foundation. Before running the model for uh, probabilistic analysis, we needed to validate that against experimental results. There's a study in the literature performed by Shira et al. Uh, they uh, studied a scale cask on a 2D shake table test and uh, reported rocking angle, displacement, and acceleration at bottom and uh, top of the cask in one of their tests. And this is how my finite element results uh, are compared with the experimental results. After validating the finite element model, we used uh, that for the probabilistic analysis and uh, 
analyze the finite element models, which gave us uh, time histories of different responses. In this study, I'm interested in the rocking response and uh, the horizontal displacements and specifically the maximum values. So this figure shows the time history response uh, from one of my analyses and the value that I'm interested in is the maximum value. Running uh, finite element models uh, are usually, uh, is usually time consuming and it needs computational resources. And this was one of the motivations to develop meta models, which I will talk about more later. Uh, because meta models uh, save time and computational resources. They can also be very useful for sensitivity analysis. So in this uh, study, I have developed uh, meta models for the maximum horizontal displacement and maximum uh, rocking angle. By meta model, I mean, an, uh, I mean a mathematical expression which predicts a target response uh, as a function of input parameters, which we call uh, predictors. For example, in this equation, y can be the maximum rocking angle and uh, x, x's, which are the predictors, could be the earthquake intensity measure or the friction coefficient between the cask and the pad or the dimensions of the uh, cask. For meta-modeling, I have used the uh, response surface method and when we fit a response surface uh, model, we are looking for model parameters, which are shown by theta and model error. I have used uh, a stepwise regression to select the best set of predictors and assess uh, the performance of the model by using five-fold cross-validation. So uh, reviewing uh, the literature on dynamic response of rigid bodies, we see that the accelerations at the uh, center of gravity of the body play important role in the dynamic response. This gave us uh, the idea to develop a dual layer meta model in which in the first layer we predict uh, the, the maximum horizontal and vertical accelerations at the body's center of gravity. After predicting those accelerations, we can estimate two dimensionless parameters, uh, which I show by RD and RR here. These uh, dimensionless parameters uh, predict the initiation of sliding and uh, rocking response. And then we can use those parameters along with the accelerations and other parameters like friction coefficient, dimensions of the cask, et cetera to predict the target responses of this study. I mean the maximum horizontal displacement and maximum rocking angle. So this is my model for the maximum uh, horizontal acceleration of the cask's uh, center of gravity. And if you uh, look at the model, you see some terms like omega and P, which I will talk about later. And this is my model for the vertical acceleration and uh, its performance. And at the end, uh, the models for maximum horizontal displacement of the cask and maximum rocking angle of the cask and how they perform. The R square of uh, all the models is at least 0.88 and uh, most of them are about 0.9. Uh, and now we move to the fragility analysis. Uh, by fragility, I mean the probability of a response uh, reaching or exceeding a limit for a given set of predictors. For example, in, this, uh, in these plots, I'm interested in knowing the probability of the maximum horizontal displacement exceeding a limit. I chose one fourth of the cask's uh, diameter as the limit. And each figure uh, shows the probability of exceedance as a function of PGA, which I have used as the earthquake intensity measure for the set of parameters which are, uh, which are given uh, here. As I mentioned before, uh, we had uh, some omega and P in the formulas. Uh, omega uh, is a parameter which tries to capture the frequency contents uh, of earthquake. 
and P is a parameter which is called the characteristic frequency of the cask. So studies uh, on rigid blocks and rigid bodies have shown that the dynamic response depends on the uh, omega over P ratio. And in this study, we uh, came up with two definitions for omega. One is omega A and the other one is omega P. Omega A tries to capture the effect of uh, short period contents of earthquake and omega V uh, tries to capture the long uh, period contents of earthquake. And our models show that for omega over P close to one, um, larger responses are expected, which is kind of a resonance phenomenon. In uh, both cases, I mean, when we look at the omega A over P and omega V over P, uh, we see that the response increases when omega over P approaches one. We can do the same um, fragility analysis uh, for the rocking response. In these plots, uh, I'm studying the probability of the rocking response larger than one fourth of the critical angle of rotation. By critical angle of rotation, I mean uh, the angle of rotation beyond which the cask falls. And the same trend applies here. I mean for omega over P close to one, uh, the response is lar larger uh, and the corresponding probabilities are larger as well. As I mentioned before, the meta models are very useful for sensitivity analyses because uh, they can be used for any given set of predictors uh, as long as uh, they fall into the uh, ranges that the meta model was trained for. In this plot, uh, I'm studying the sensitivity of the horizontal displacement to the friction coefficient. And as we expect for smaller friction coefficients, we want to see uh, larger uh, displacements, which um, this plot basically shows. For the smallest friction coefficient, which is 0.2 here, we have the largest probability of failure. The sensitivity analysis uh, was also done for the rocking response. Uh, the rocking response is sensitive to more variables, uh, including friction coefficient, the dimension of the cask, and the critical angle of rotation. If we look at the sensitivity to the friction coefficient, we see that for larger friction coefficients, we have larger probability of uh, failure. And that's because for large friction coefficients, the cask cannot slide and the dominant mode of motion is rocking. And therefore, uh, larger rocking motions are expected. The second parameter is the dimension of the cask. Studies on rigid blocks uh, have shown that for geometrically similar blocks, uh, the block with larger dimensions is more stable and experiences smaller angles of rotation. Same pattern applies to the casks, and for a cask with larger dimensions, we observe smaller rocking angles. And then uh, moving to the critical angle of rotation for casks with larger critical angle of rotation, uh, we see smaller rocking angles. This pattern also applies to uh, rigid bodies. Another application of the fragility curves is uh, risk analysis. We can integrate uh, our hazard over the fragility curve to estimate uh, the risk for any given location. In this uh, slide, I'm sh uh, I have chosen seismic hazard curves from USGS website for a location on the West Coast, uh, on Central US, and then on the east coast. And I have calculated this integral to estimate the annual risk for large horizontal displacement and uh, for large rocking angles. If you look at the numbers which uh, show the risk, we see that the risk is one order of magnitude larger on the west coast, which is expected because of the seismicity of the region. And if I want to compare these numbers with acceptable limits uh, in the nuclear industry, I compare them with uh, core damage, uh, 
So core damage uh, is a metric which uh, assesses an event in which the core of a reactor is damaged, but no release of radioactive material happens. Uh, the seismic response of the casks is similar in the sense that the casks might experience large motions, but it does not necessarily mean release of radioactive material. The acceptable annual risk for the core damage in the nuclear industry is 10 to power of minus four. And for the set of parameters that we chose here, uh, the rocking uh, risk, the risk for rocking on the west coast approaches that limit. And I should uh, uh, emphasize that it does not mean release of radioactive material and to have a comprehensive understanding and estimate the overall risk, we need to analyze uh, cases in which two adjacent casks hit each other because of large rocking motions and see what happens in that scenario. So this wraps up my uh, seismic analysis part and now I move to the tip over analysis part. The tip over analysis follows uh, the uh, same five steps. I mean experimental design, finite element analysis, meta modeling, fragility analysis, and risk estimation. In the tip over analysis part, uh, I want to uh, study the structural response of the cast where it falls down and uh, hits its foundation. Uh, the motion starts at the critical angle of rotation of the cask. Uh, in this uh, problem, I have chosen a fixed geometry for the cask, so the geometric parameters of the cask do not change. And I have basically focused on the uh, material variation in the cask, foundation, and soil. The only geometric parameter which changes in my problem is the thickness of the pad. I am uh, also interested in the cask's age. As I mentioned before, these structures have to be used for long periods of time. So age of the cask is another parameter which changes in my models. Since we considered uh, the age of the cask as a, a parameter, we needed to update uh, some material properties associated to that. Uh, as time passes, the temperature at different parts of the cask go down. And uh, this plot shows how the temperature goes down at different parts of the cask, like the fuel basket, the canister, and the liner. And corresponding to that, the material behavior of these parts, which are made of steel, are uh, affected. These two figures show how the modulus of elasticity and the yielding stress of these parts uh, change in time. If you look at the modulus of elasticity of steel, you see that the uh, main changes happen during the first 10 years of service, which I will talk about this uh, more later. For the analysis of this problem, I have used uh, Alestina, and this uh, figure shows uh, one of my models. I have considered the soil, the foundation, and uh, the cask. So the cask has different parts. One is the concrete overpack, which is shown by blue here. It also has a reinforcement. And then the liner, the canister, and the basket. So the basket basically holds the fuel rods and it is, uh, it's inserted into the canister and the canister is inserted into the liner, which is sealed on top by lid. Before running this uh, model for probabilistic analyses, I uh, validated that against experimental designs. So our colleagues in University of Houston uh, performed an experiment on a scale cask and they released the cask uh, from a 45 degree angle and it hit its foundation. Uh, they reported cracking patterns and also vertical accelerations and stresses, uh, which I will talk about now. In this figure, uh, I'm comparing the damage patterns on the side of the cask. In the experiment, uh, the cracks uh, begin on top, of, on top of the cask and then inclined cracks develop towards the middle of the cask and there's not much crack on, on the bottom. 
In my finite element model, I have used a continuous surface cap model for the concrete, uh, which gives me the damage pattern and it's similar to what we observed in the experiment. I mean, uh, a concentration of damage on top and middle of the cask and also inclined patterns of uh, damage. Another parameter of interest in impact tests is uh, acceleration. In this study, uh, the researchers reported the maximum vertical acceleration. Uh, in this figure, I'm showing uh, my results with the experimental results, and the average difference between the results is about 6%. I compared also my uh, stress results uh, in the rebars uh, with the results reported from the experiment and the average difference in this case is uh, about 6% again. So after, valid, uh, after validating the finite element model, we used it for uh, the analysis of the 200 configurations. And uh, we again developed a meta model. For meta modeling, I used response surface method and uh, stepwise regression for selecting the best set of predictors. And I evaluated the model performance by using five-fold cost validation. In an impact scenario for the casks, uh, one of the main concerns is that the cask maintains its integrity. And we do not want to see any release of radioactive material. Uh, for that, uh, usually in the industry, the main concern is on the canister. And we don't want to see any fracture in the canister. Uh, to study that, we have developed a meta model for the maximum strain in the canister, uh, which I show here, and how the uh, model performs. I should mention that, uh, fortunately, we did not observe any uh, fracture in the canister. Uh, how, uh, but we observed many yielding cases. Uh, in fact, in almost all the cases, the canister yields, but it does not fracture, which is good news. Uh, and we used uh, this meta model for fragility analysis and sensitivity analysis because it gives us some idea about the variation of risk uh, in time and also how it is affected by different design parameters. So for fragility analysis, uh, I chose uh, a limit and developed uh, a fragility surface as a function of the initial angular velocity and age of the cask. Looking at different cross sections of the fragility surface, uh, we see that uh, the fragility increases with the age of the cask. Uh, it means uh, aging increases the probability of failure. However, the main uh, variations in the fragility happen during the 10, uh, 10 years, uh, uh, the first 10 years of service. And that's because uh, the model that uh, I showed uh, takes into account the steel material properties. And as I mentioned before, the main variations of the steel material properties happen during the first 10 years and uh, the fragility curves uh, show the same trend. The meta model was uh, also used for sensitivity analysis and the, in these plots I'm showing uh, how the response uh, reacts to variations in the compressive uh, strength of the concrete in the overpack and also pad uh, parameters. Looking at the compressive strength of the overpack we see that for a stronger concrete in the overpack, smaller uh, failure probabilities are resulted. But when we look at the pad, uh, any variable or any changes which makes the pad stiffer applies uh, more forces or stronger forces to the cask, which leads to increase in the probability of failure. For example, if we use uh, uh, high strength concrete in the over in the, in the pad, the probability of failure increases, which is shown by the black curve here. And if we increase the thickness of the pad, it also makes the pad stiffer and it uh, increases the probability of failure. 
Another application uh, of the meta model uh, that I showed uh, is studying the aging effects on the cask. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the casks have to be used uh, for long periods of time and aging uh, is a threat. Uh, in these figures, I'm studying the ASR effect uh, on the casks. ASR is a phenomenon in which usually the mechanical properties of the cask uh, of, of concrete are affected and usually the compressive strength, tensile strength and modulus of elasticity reduce. So if we can combine uh, studies on ASR effects on concrete with the meta model that I just showed, we can update our fragility. And these are uh, the results from five different studies on ASR. And as we see in all cases, the probability of failure increases for the ASR affected casks. And in the cases that the reduction in the uh, initial compressive strength was larger, larger increases observed. For example, in the worst case, uh, which is the bottom left figure, uh, the reduction was about 30% in the compressive strength. And at the end of the test, uh, the compressive strength was about 70% of its initial value. And as we see, we have the larger jump in the, uh, in, in, in the probability of failure. Another application of the meta model and the fragility analysis is the risk estimation. So we can uh, integrate over the fragility and estimate the risk. Uh, this figure shows how the risk in the tip over problem uh, varies with time. And as we see for, for older casks, we have uh, more risk of failure. And the same pattern that we observed in the sensitivity analysis applies here. I mean, uh, a stronger concrete in the overpack reduces the risk, but uh, a, a larger strength for the pad, for the concrete uh, in the pad, and also a thicker pad increase the risk. Uh, these plots uh, suggest that from a design perspective, we should use, uh, we should use concrete with higher strength for the overpack, but we should reduce uh, the strength of the concrete and the, and the thickness of the pad as long as other structural cr criteria are met. So this wraps up my uh, tip over analysis. And now I want to talk about the role of HPC in research projects like mine. So this is the workflow that I showed you before. And I used, uh, I had to use uh, high performance computing for running my models. In the seismic analysis part, I had about 500 models and each of them took three hours at least on 96 cores. For the tip over analysis, I had uh, 200 models and each of them took about three hours again on 96 cores. And this means that without uh, high performance computing, I was not able uh, to do this research. The workflow that I usually uh, follow to prepare my models and then analyze and post-process them uh, is shown here. I usually prepare my models on my computer desktop and then I submit them uh, to a cluster and then I transfer the results to my desktop computer again for post-processing. Uh, one cool thing about DesignSafe is that now this entire process is available on DesignSafe. Recently, uh, a college of mine and I tested this process on DesignSafe. I mean, we, we created a finite element model in LSINA on DesignSafe and then submitted that to Stampy. And uh, then we did post-processing uh, on the results. I know that design safe people uh, have been uh, working on this and they had some issues uh, with the license. Uh, I'm not sure if the licensing issue is solved or not, uh, but uh, once that is solved, you can uh, basically use design safe for research projects like mine. Okay, so 
In conclusion, uh, in this presentation, I talked about seismic analysis and tip over analysis of vertical concrete dry casks. In the seismic analysis, uh, I developed uh, meta models for the maximum rocking angle and maximum horizontal displacement of the casks. These meta models can be used for fragility and risk analysis, or they can be used by other researchers or uh, engineers for any given set of predictors. Uh, looking at the risk, uh, this study suggests that uh, the risk approaches acceptable limits uh, in the industry for the rocking motion. However, it does not mean release of radioactive material. For the tip over analysis, we also performed a probabilistic study and uh, our finite element models uh, show that uh, fracture is not expected for the canister, which is good news. Uh, and we also performed a sensitivity analysis, which gave us some uh, suggestions for, for design. To finish this project and estimate the overall seismic risk uh, to the dry cask uh, storage system, I still need to analyze the scenario in which two adjacent casks hit each other and I want to know what happens in that scenario and if we have any fractures or not. At the end, uh, I would like to uh, thank my sponsor for supporting this project and also Rice and Design Safe for letting me use their high performance computing infrastructure. And uh, this is my email. If you have any questions or anything to discuss, uh, just feel free to email me. And at the end, I would like to thank you and I'll be happy to answer your questions. That's great. Thank you, Majid. Uh, a very interesting presentation and certainly a problem that will be around for a long time. Uh, at this point, uh, we will open uh, the question and answer session. Uh, attendees, uh, you're reminded uh, that questions should be submitted through the chat panel uh, and sent to the moderator. Um, and I think we have a, a couple questions for you. Um, uh, I guess the first one might be pretty simple. Uh, where are the casks located? So these casks are located almost everywhere in the country, but the concentration is more on the East Coast. And uh, there are some on the West Coast as well, but the main concentration is on the East Coast. Um, Majid, how did you characterize the uh, ground shaking um, for the different regions? So I uh, performed an earthquake selection for the different regions, uh, which I showed before. So I, ha I did earthquake selection for west of U.S., uh, central U.S., and eastern U.S. And we had uh, ground motion suites for each of these seismic zones. And we analyzed the 160 configurations that I showed subjected to each uh, ground motion suite, which were selected for each of these regions. Sorry, how, ma how many ground motions? Uh, so we had 160 ground motions, and we paired them with the 160 configurations. Okay. But this was done for three different regions, so it gave us 480 models in total. Okay. Um, in the configuration of these casks, um, they're standalone, but how much space is there between the casks? And the follow-up question is, uh, is there any mechanical, there isn't any mechanical um, uh, tie downs to the casks, but is that considered at all or an option or why isn't there? Uh, the gap between these casks is four to uh, eight feet, uh, which is 1.2 to 2.4 meters. Uh, the way these casks have been constructed is that they're not attached uh, to the foundation. And uh, the concern about, you know, the seismic motions uh, have come, come up recently. And uh, as I know, it's not uh, allowed based on the standards to uh, attach them to the foundation now. So that has been the traditional way, the conventional way these casks have been constructed. Okay. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about um, 
the vertical uh, ground acceleration um, as a predictor for the um, maybe the PSDM development. Can you speak to that a little bit more? Uh, so I tested different uh, IMs uh, for the earthquake, including the vertical acceleration uh, of the earthquake, uh, but it did not improve my meta models, uh, so I did not use in the final meta models, but, but I tested its effect. Okay. Um, and maybe just one last question, um, since we're looking at the geographical distribution of, of, of the um, sites considered. Um, and back to the hazard and how you characterized it, did, was there a, um, a different probability of, of uh, tipping for the different regions or um, is, is, is there a safer location for these to be um, centrally located? So obviously, uh, where we have a lower seismic hazard, the probability or the risk of failure is, is lower. Uh, which I talked about here in the risk analysis section. So if you look at the risk at different locations, it's higher on the West Coast and it's smaller for the Central US and for the East Coast. So it, it depends mm -hmm. on the seismicity of the region and uh, how close is the casks uh, to the uh, seismic sources. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much. Um, we're at the conclusion of today's Early Career Researcher Forum. On behalf of the attendees, thank you, Majid, for taking the time to share this research. My pleasure. Uh, yeah. And to the attendees, thank you for your participation and questions. Uh, please check the Sim Center's website at simcenter.designsafe-ci.org and check your uh, inbox for emails uh, from announce at designsafe CI. Um, from there, you can find registration links to upcoming webinars uh, in the Early Career Researcher Forum and the Natural Hazards Engineering 101 webinar series. Thank you for attending today's uh, forum.